About ten years ago, if you'd been in the west of England and happened to pass by Ottery Farm between two and three in the afternoon, you might have noticed a small boy who didn't seem to mind at all how much smaller he was than the cows he was bringing in for milking. The little boy's name was John Hockin, and he'd never known any other life than on his father's farm. John's father was a farmer's son too, and for that matter, there'd been a Hockin at Ottery Farm as long as anyone could remember. These Hawkins must have been good farmers, for their land showed how much care, and what is more to the point, how much hard work they put into it, father and son, generation after generation. So when John grew up and his school days were over, it wasn't surprising that he should want to be a farmer too. It was really what everyone had expected. And it was what his father had always wanted. I, I well remember that afternoon when the boy came home from his last day at school. He was so excited to be finished with books and classrooms, or so he thought. Oh yes, I was pleased all right that he wanted to be a farmer, but it wasn't quite as simple as that. Farming's a very different affair now than what it was when his mother and I first started. It's much more complicated more specialised than it was then. For one thing, there's much more writing and headwork to it nowadays. All these official forms to be filled up. Oh, we had quite an argument, I can tell you. But I think he saw the sense of it in the end, especially when his mother backed me up in what I was saying. You've got to know about science, John, I told him, about uh, machinery and medicine and how to keep accounts. Aye, there's a lot you want to learn yet. So back John went to school again, but this time it was to an agricultural college not very far from his own home. Yes, back I went to school, and there's no use pretending I wasn't pretty fed up about it at first. I wanted to be out on the farm, and here I was sitting around in the classrooms listening to lectures. I just couldn't see what it had got to do with being a farmer. Later, I began to see the connection between lectures and farming. For instance, we were told how plants need chemicals to help them grow. And then we were shown how to make up fertilizers by mixing these chemicals together in the right proportions. And after that, we learned the best way of spreading the fertilizers on the fields. In another class, we were told how plants can get attacked by all sorts of different diseases and pests. And then to follow this up, we learned how to spray fruit trees to protect them from these attacks. There are all sorts of ways in which fruit crops can get spoilt, and the trees had to be sprayed three or four times a year. We had quite a big horticultural department at the college, and anyone who wanted to specialise in market gardening, or fruit or flower growing, could learn all the ropes. Then, as well as the lecture classes, we did all sorts of laboratory work and experiments in biology, chemistry and things. One of the most interesting things we learned in the labs was how to analyse the soil. In this way you could find out the state of the soil in any field. And then you knew what fertilisers it needed and what crops it would grow best. 
To show how this all worked out in practice, there were several trial plots in the college grounds where we grew different varieties of crops under different conditions. Then we could compare the results and see for ourselves how the condition of the soil affected the quality of the crop. But if you're going to go in for mixed farming like most British farmers do, it's just as important to know about animals as about soil and crops. We had a lot of livestock at the college and we learned how to feed and look after them and what to do if they went sick. I don't mean in cases of serious sickness, of course, but enough to be able to give first aid before the vet came, or even save him a visit altogether. Then sometimes we'd go to other farms round about to get experience of different breeds of cattle, and we always had it drummed into us how important cleanliness was. All the pails and buckets had to be sterilized at every milking. We had to be clean, and the cows had to be clean, if you wanted to get clean milk. Then we learned how to test samples of milk. By spinning it around, you could separate the butter fat and measure it, and that's how you knew how rich the milk was. Another test was for the cleanliness of milk. In this, you added chemicals to milk samples and then heated them, and by comparing the colors, you could tell the number of harmful bacteria in each, and that told you how long the milk would keep. A lot of the milk that came from our own cows went to the college dairy to be made into butter or cheese. It was chiefly the students taking the dairying course who worked there. There were always a lot of girl students among them, though we learned something about it in the general farming course too. Another special side was the poultry department. Of course, most farmers or their wives keep some poultry or another. We do at home to get eggs for the house and a goose or a turkey at Christmas. But if you want to specialize in poultry keeping and go in for it in a big way, there's a lot to be learnt, such as how to increase egg production by selective breeding. For instance, one of the things we were shown was how to breed so that you could tell the sex of day-old chicks by their color. But as I was taking the general farming course, it was mostly the work on the college farm that concerned me. We had about 400 acres of our own land where we put into practice what we'd been taught in the lecture rooms and labs. We had to learn how to handle every sort of farm machine and how to drive or make a tractor. And we had to be able to keep the machine in working order ourselves, know all about their insides and how to do running repairs. I knew how useful that was because I remember the mess we got into at home once when the tractor broke down miles from the nearest garage. I'd always liked taking machinery to bits, so I enjoyed these classes. Then again at home, I always used to think it was just a matter of trial and error to set the plough so that it went in the right depth. But now I learned that like everything else, a plough is built on scientific principles. And when you knew all about things like the center of resistance, you could tell just what was going to happen before you ever started to plow. So John Hawkins spent two years at the college. Some of it in the lecture rooms and laboratories, and some of it on the farm. Theory and practice, cause and effect. Aye, and that's just what I'd intended for the boy. To my way of thinking, no man can be a good farmer these days unless he does know all these things. I mean, he must understand how to use science properly, have a good working knowledge of mechanics, know something about medicine and how to treat sick animals, to be able to organize and keep accounts, and be a bit of a salesman too when need be, as well as just how to plow and reap and sow. I only wish I'd had the same chance when I was a lad. <laughs> In 
It was a pretty strenuous course, all right, and we had to work hard to get through it all in two years. And we always had pretty good appetites by the end of the day. And then there was another thing I learned at college, though it wasn't part of the course at all. And that was how many different sorts of people there are connected with farming in one way or another. The other students weren't by any means all farmers' sons wanting to be farmers like myself. Take some of those in my year, for instance. There was Chris Bunt. He liked glasshouse work and wanted to go in for market gardening. Then there was Philip Swan, the son of a businessman. He'd probably take up some executive job. Jill Wallace loved animals and wanted to be a vet. She'd always lived in the country. But Pam Foxley came from the town and wanted an outdoor life. She was taking the poultry course. Then there were always some who were keen on science, like Bill Meakin. So he was interested in the scientific side of farming. And a few overseas students. Chris Chalham came from Switzerland and was taking his diploma in dairying. All sorts and kinds, as you can see. And as the nearest town was somewhere away, we used to make our own fun in the evenings. Mechanized farmers have now taken the place of the Bill Brewers, Jan Stewart's, and old Uncle Tom Cobbleys of the old song, whose great great grandchildren today are no longer isolated farmers, each working their land in their own way, but essential links in a great and vital national industry. Looking forward to tomorrow's needs, Britain is training the future members of her agricultural community. The horticulturists and the market gardeners the organizers and the executive officers, the vets and the livestock breeders, the poultry farmers and the smallholders, the scientists, the chemists and engineers, the dairymen and the milk producers, and of course the general farmers like John Hockin, the farmer's son, who remain as they always have been the mainstay of Britain's agriculture. Aye, and it's good to have the boy at home again, to work with me on the farm. Though it's funny to feel that he knows more about some things than I do now. Not that my experience doesn't count for something, Mark, here. But he's going to get that experience now, in the long duel with nature that is every farmer's life. But he'll have had a better start than I had. And one day, he's going to run this farm on his own. And when that day comes, I know he won't let the land down. So good luck to him.